Okay, great. It looks like folks have been able to log in. Um, well, wait, welcome everyone to tonight's panel discussion with this incredible cohort of artists who participated in our Encoding Futures Speculative Monuments for LA Summer Residency. Um, tonight, we have Nancy Baker Cahill, Audrey Chan, Joel Garcia with Metzley Projects, Patrick Martinez, in conversation moderated by Dr. Patricia Kim. Um, so my name is Frankie. I'm part of the team here at Oxy Arts. And I had the honor um, this summer working with Nancy, Audrey, Howell, and Patrick to bring their augmented reality projects to life. Um, before we kick off the discussion, I just wanted to begin with an acknowledgement that Oxy Arts occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Tongva people. Um, I know we're on a virtual call. Some of you might be calling in from other places. Um, so if you're outside of LA and would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land that you're on. And I'd also like to point out that the webinar is being recorded and live streamed to YouTube. We don't have closed captioning in Zoom, um, but I will put the YouTube link in the, I'll message it to you all. So if anyone would like to open up the YouTube window, you can access closed captioning there. Um, and then the second thing I'd like to point out is that there will be time for questions at the end of the discussion. So we'd love for you to add in any questions throughout the call to the Q&A function in Zoom. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Patricia Kim, who will be moderating the conversation and will introduce the artists. Dr. Patricia Kim is an art historian, curator, and educator based in New York City. She's currently the Associate Director of Public Engagement and the editor at Monument Lab and an assistant professor faculty fellow at the Gallatin School of Individualized Study at New York University. Kim's research, teaching, and curatorial projects use art historical and archeological methods to explore questions of gender, race, power, and memory from antiquity to the present. She is currently writing Bodies of Power, the Art and Archeology span of Rural Women from the Hellenistic World, the first book length study on the visual and material culture of ancient queenship that engages with discourses in critical race, feminism, and cultural heritage studies. Kim is co-editor of Time Skills, Thinking Across Ecological Temporalities and Shaping the Past. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Patricia Kim. Thank you so much, Frankie, and thank you to Oxy Arts and um, everyone that is here and joining us this evening for this really exciting conversation. Welcome to Encoding Features, Speculative Monuments for LA, a remote summer residency program organized by Oxy Arts with a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and an editorial partnership with Monument Lab, as Frankie uh, so generously introduced me. Uh, my name is Trisha Kim and I'm the Associate Director of Public Engagement at Monument Lab. And I'm currently calling in from New York City, which is on the ancestral lands of the Lenny Lenape peoples. I'm thrilled to be moderating tonight's conversation um, since I've been a longtime fan um, of all of these artists. So over a three month period, these LA based artists, Nancy Baker Cahill, Audrey Chan, Joel Garcia with Metzley Project, and Patrick Martinez researched and developed original virtual monuments to be geolocated at sites across their city. And you are invited to engage with these monuments as they're accessible for the public to view through the Fourth Wall app. You can also learn more about these projects at oxy.edu backslash oxy dash arts and read more about these four projects in the artist's own words on Monument Lab's Bulletin, which is an online platform for exploring memory, monuments, and public history. This exciting residency program emerged in conjunction with an exhibition called Encoding Features, Critical Imaginaries of AI, which is co-curated by Oxy Arts and Dr. Mashinka Faroon Sakopian, Mellon Professor of the Practice at Occidental College. And you can view the stunning works and engage with its compelling, uh, transformative themes and ideas at Oxy Arts on York until Friday, November 19th, and learn more about the works that, quote, envision speculative futures engineered for just outcomes. And I should say that the four artists today have done just that with their monuments. Over the summer, these four artists created visionary monuments that imagined a future Los Angeles as a decolonized, anti-racist, and equitable landscape, a space where power holders could be held accountable and systems and structures of violence would be abolished. 
Today, we'll learn more from the four artists who participated in the summer residency. Um, and I'm super lucky to share this time with them and learn more from them. For the sake of time, I will give very brief introductions to each of our esteemed artists, but please head over to the project pages to learn more about their impressive work, their honors, and uh, their forthcoming projects as well. So Nancy Baker Cahill is a new media artist who examines power, selfhood, and embodied consciousness through drawing and shared immersive space. She's the founder and artistic director of Fourth Wall, a free augmented reality art platform exploring resistance, exploring resistance and inclusive creative expression. Her monument is called Motherboard, geolocated, geolocated above Los Angeles City Hall, and it proposes a newly imagined decentralized system of governance that supports kinship, equity, and community care. Audrey Chan is an artist, illustrator, and educator. Her research-based projects use drawing, painting, public art, and video to challenge dominant historical narratives through allegories of power, place, and identity. She's currently the inaugural artist in residence at the ACLU of Southern California, and her large-scale public artwork for the future Little Arts or Little Tokyo Arts District Metro Station will open in 2022. Her monument is called the Asada Center, geolocated on top of the existing LA Police Protective League, and through it, Chan imagines a future community center in its place and visualizes what would be possible if we collectively divested from policing. Joel Garcia is an artist, arts administrator, and cultural organization organizer. Well, actually, Joel is like an organization in terms of like the amount of work that he does. So we'll go with that too. But Joel has over 20 years of experience working transnationally, focusing on community centered strategies. He's a co founder of Metsley Projects, an indigenous based arts and culture collaborative centering indigeneity to advocate for and organize to highlight issues impacting Native artists and youth. His monument is called Astro Rizal Networks. The monument sits at the site of the former Junipero Serra statue, visualizing a future in Los Angeles where Native people are not just acknowledged, but land has been returned and new growth has begun. Patrick Martinez maintains a very diverse practice that includes mixed media landscape paintings, neon sign pieces, cake paintings, and his peachy series of appropriative works. His works evoke place and socioeconomic position and further unearth sites of personal, civic, and cultural loss. His monument is called Homegrown, a monument that anticipates a future in Los Angeles where affordable housing is accessible to people who have lived in LA for generations and where community members are valued for their presence in their city. So at this point, I'd love to welcome Nancy, Audrey, Joel, and Patrick to the virtual stage. Everyone, please clap for them, welcome them. Hello, you can unmute yourselves now. How are you doing? Great. Oh. Thrilled to be here. Yeah, so lucky and honored to be here. Well, I am really honored to be in your presence. And um, before we start the conversation, I just wanna encourage our audience members to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, to comment, to ask questions um, at any point in time, and we will turn to them. Um, so let's dive in. Now, the monuments of encoding futures are very are varied and eclectic. Um, in fact, I think augmented reality as a tool can be generative in the way that it enables communities and artists to imagine monuments that are unsanctioned or unauthorized. But beyond the platform itself, um, you each built and proposed different kinds of monuments. For instance, Audrey, you envisioned a community center. Patrick drew on his practice with neon signs and Joel's work advocated for a new relationship to a site of trauma, while Nancy's motherboard takes the shape of a spine just hovering over LA City Hall. So my first question to you is, what might these incredibly diverse practices teach us about 
monuments, especially during a cultural moment when communities and governments alike are rethinking and redressing their monumental practices. Well, I will, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Nancy. I was just gonna say that uh, one of the real thrills of this residency was the invitation to imagine a speculative monument, which was a really different task, I think, from um, more traditional considerations of, of past you know, historical monuments. And um, although obviously we've involved them, especially in Noel's case, but to really sort of imagine, to task us with imagining something in the future. And that was a very different uh, creative process and it was a very different philosophical process. Um, and so it, 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 it was just kind of, I think, um, exhilarating artistically to, to really get in the trenches with what, you know, if we're going to imagine a better future, what would that actually look like? And that's actually not an easy task. It, it, it really required, I think, all, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but it, I think we all really grappled with, you know, if there was one thing we could, we could isolate or a series of the related things that we could isolate, um, as a sort of hope for the future, what would those things be? So that really, to me, distinguished it from a lot of other conversations around monuments heretofore. Yeah, I think the, the primary thing, um, one of the questions I had with, with entering this or accepting the residency was, um, sorry with the helicopter, I'm in, I'm in East LA, so. Um, <laughs> um, was, the interaction between the four of us. I've been, you know, I've been on the other end of, of residencies or like facilitating these processes where like it feels very disconnected. So I really did appreciate the um, the relationship between all four of us through this um, and how it influenced our process as well. That that I think is really important as as artists and and makers um, here in Los Angeles. And I really love that at the end of this whole thing, like there was not a monument to a person, but mm -hmm. to moments and to process and to, you know, to care. Um, so for me, that was the biggest takeaway, you know, that pushing beyond the human figure, the, the accomplishments of people, mostly over domination over other people, you know? Um, so for me, that was, that was big. I think the, um, uh, yeah, I agree with Coel in that I was like, wow, I get to be part of this like dream team of artists who have like such different practices, but like a similar um, ethic in um, like what we, how we want our work to connect with the reality that we're living in and with different points in history and the questions that they're raising. And I think the prompt for me forced me to confront a lot of my own assumptions of what monuments are in that they're like, they're fixed, they're inert, um, that they're about something important from the past and that they're something like apart from what's like living and breathing. So I think for me, I had to acknowledge that um, before realizing that, okay, if I think of this category that we're working on as like living monuments that suddenly like opened up a whole different way of thinking about it as um, monuments, not as like a time capsule of like past values, but rather something that could like be part of our everyday lives that still has that um, impulse to call something important and worth lasting, um, but also something that was like more porous and responsive to um, our reality. Yeah, I mean, with me, I, I, um, I was eager to use materials or um, like Audrey was saying, just like uh, things that we could probably uh, find um, in our everyday lives and place them or in the position of a monument. And, um, you know, um, I know that there are uh, assumptions of what a monument should be or what they, you know, uh, people kind of view monuments as like, you know, these bronze statues or something that's a uh, giant made out of stone or um, I was, I found it uh, 
you know, the, um, the residency to be um, great because I, I'm able to, I was eager to put something um, together um, that pushed back on that. And it used, you know, uh, it, it was an opportunity to use materials every day um, to, um, so that people can kind of um, reconsider um, their surroundings and, um, you know, what, what can be looked at as a monument. Yeah, Patrick, I think with your work in particular, what was so striking is that um, you took on materials that you your practice is very uh, comfortable in, if you will, um, and used it to sort of play on, you know, play with the real estate, the billboards, right? Mm -hmm. um, kind of um, um, call attention to how these billboards and these the presence of these big commercial real estate companies as oppressive monuments. And so I thought that was really evocative in your work. Um, and something that I want to um, go back to is what Audrey said about how um, really all of your monuments focus on community, right? Mm -hmm. Community-driven practices, um, really uplifting notions of kinship networks, risal networks, if you will. Um, and so I want to ask you about your own community and your own kin, right? All of you are currently based in the city that we now call Los Angeles. Um, and so I wonder what is Los Angeles to you? What is your community? Um, and how does your experience with and living in your community in LA inform your work? And how does that connect it, connect to the specific sites that you chose? Uh, you know, anyone that's been to Los Angeles city and county um, understands like actually how diverse uh, LA is <laughs> in terms of um, its demographic makeup um, along, you know, racial, um, ethnic, um, uh, you know, um, sort of uh, class lines, right? And so I'm wondering if you might share with us um, you know, what your experience has been sort of living in Los Angeles and how that's informed your work. I'm, I've come to like, accept that Los Angeles is an idea, like an undeveloped idea, of not necessarily a city yet. It's like so undeveloped, you know, you talk, you, you, you look at other places, other communities um, where there is like this very distinct value system, even if it's like um, super toxic, like in Texas, right? Um, like don't mess with Texas and stuff. But there's like this, this thing that people adhere to. Like if you move to that city, like people become a champion of that, whatever that is, right? That model. LA, it, you know, I was born and raised here and this, I mean, LA is authentic but there also has like this sheen of like un unauthenticity to it because there's a lot of unresolved, just, just a lot of things unresolved here. Um, we, we operate off of the notion that downtown LA has always been the center of the city and it, and it, and it isn't, right? And the narrative um, itself creates a lot of erasure. And so we celebrate that like, you know, that um, out with the old in with the new type of scenario here. Uh, like, will, will I ever leave LA? Probably not. I, you know, I'm really attached to this place. And I thought because it was like, the food here, like the food here is amazing. Um, I also thought because of like just the proximity of so many different things, but I've come to realize that it's the, it's the proximity to the ocean and like my body, like the ancestral, whatever's in here is connected to the ocean that that's probably why I'll, I'll, I'll stay in LA. But there's, you know, to me, it, it is an undeveloped idea. Like the LA has no value system. Like what is that value system that like we operate off of here in Los Angeles as like as Angelinos? What is it that drives us to be Angelinos? I can't think of anything I've thought about it for like a long time. Like there just isn't. It's such a, like a disconnected city intentionally um, that I think in that disconnection is where white supremacy operates. Well, I grew up um, in the Midwest um, outside of Chicago. And so I definitely grew up with 
uh, whatever Hollywood exported <laughs> outside of uh, itself to tell LA's story. And so, you know, that's very uh, limiting for sure and whitewashed, definitely. And I'm a transplant, so I came out here for grad school. And I have to say that I don't think I'd be the kind of artist that I am today without being here. It's like so much of my practice and my projects has been about like learning LA and um, having the opportunity to talk with different communities about like what their stories they want to persist um, into the future, you know, um, narratives of like violence and expulsion and also like acceptance all kind of like layered together. And so I, it's one of those things where it's like, once you start, uh, it's like just a tip of the iceberg. Um, and I, I have like a different investment here because um, now I have a son who's almost four and he's born and raised here and he'll have a totally different relationship with this place, but also makes me invested in a different way. Like how can we work to make sure the city is like better <laughs> for him and for like the next generation. So that's something I've been thinking about lately. That's so beautiful. I, I have to say, I'm so inspired by what you both said. And I've been here, I'm also a transplant from a place with a very strong identity, which is Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm not saying it's a good one, <laughs> um, but um, I agree with, with everything you both said. And I would also say that like, interestingly, not, as we talk about this, it's such a wonderful provocative question because I sort of feel like LA is the ultimate decentralized um, decentralized city, but as you pointed out, well, it's not decentralized with any kind of equity built in. It's it's decentralized with a lot of inequity, and um, and and you know, I feel like within that decentralization, there's also a lot of isolation, whether it's from living in cars or just being literally physically geographically separated. And some of my most um, I don't know. Uh, visceral moments of, of kinship have occurred at Dodger Stadium um, and in big public moments of great, you know, marches, protests, things where you really suddenly look around and say, oh my God, this, this is the idea, you know, that you're talking about. This is Los Angeles. And, um, and, it, and it, it's interesting because, you know, the first time I felt genuinely connected to this city was when I started working at Homeboy Industries in Boyle Heights. And I really engaged with a community I did not have any experience with prior to that. And it, it, it really changed me um, indelibly. And, and that in addition to also having children here and realizing that I was raising um, Angelino children, whatever that means, uh, was, was profound. And, and, and like the sort of mycelial networks that, I, that I'm sort of imagining in the monument, I feel that um, over 25 years, I have also been fortunate enough to have a network of uh, and a community that is broad and diverse and ever growing and expanding. And to me, that's sort of the dream. And when people talk about like, well, aren't you gonna leave because of the climate? Aren't you gonna leave about because of this or that? And um, my answer is pretty much no. I mean, I can't imagine recreating that network anywhere else. It feels really special. And um, so that, that is directly related to the monument, I think. And that's why it's such a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, I've, I'm 41 years old now. I've been here for 41 years. Um, and uh, my community just keeps on, like, you know, Nancy was saying, just like the, the type, it just expands. Um, like every year, it feels like almost like, um, you know, I've lived in different parts of the city all my life. And um, people that I connect with, uh, people that become friends since I was, you know, young, teenager, young, you know, young adult, um, you know, they're located in different parts of the city. Um, and those different pockets that are, you know, uh, specific to a certain area and separated by freeways, things like that. Um, the relationship I have is, you know, with the city is like, you know, using the bus when I was a teenager to get two friends that lived in a certain area, um, them coming to see me and that just kind of expanding 
throughout the years. So being able to see, see the city grow and different pockets of the city um, kind of uh, develop. Um, and just like even like, you know, um, uh, some cities being erased or different things, you know, just kind of like uh, that personality or that what it was once uh, kind of, um, you know, known for is just kind of being um, um, erased. So, I mean, um, it's kind of, for me, a dynamic kind of um, experience when I, when I view it that way. And I think about that a lot, um, um, you know, being able to be, you um, here all my life, I've, I've seen it kind of uh, um, develop and, and change, but um, also some parts um, staying the same. Um, friends um, inviting me into their area, um, you know, um, exchanging stories and ideas, um, them kind of doing things a certain way, me, me doing my thing a certain way. It's just an exchange. Um, and and I, I value that. I value all my friends and um, family and community, um, I guess, that are in um, my network and the people that I just kind of like um, I'm able to kind of um, connect with and, and touch base with in, in Los Angeles. I'm really, um, I really like what you're saying, Patrick. And, you know, the word that kept coming to my brain as you were talking, actually, as um, Nancy was talking, was the word conundrum. Like, mm. to me, LA is such a contradictory city <laughs> that, you know, it's a visionary city in some ways. It's a very decentralized city, right? Partly because of the way that it's geographically laid out, but also yeah. because of the way that it's um, spread out. But it's, but it's contradictory in that, as your work really clearly points out, um, there's so much inequality, right, baked into the actual fabric of the city, but also, you know, in, in terms of social services and so on and so forth. Um, and so I guess what I'm wondering is if you would be all willing to think with me about uh, sort of the word incommensurability. That is to say that um, there's something that's slipping. There's something that's missing. There's something incommensurable with kind of like the vision of LA, this, mm -hmm. this potential for decentralized kinship mycelial networks. And yet, you know, there's a sort of overdevelopment, gentrification, over-policing. Um, so I, there's something there that's, it, it's, a, it's contradictory. And so I'm wondering if any of you have sort of thought about um, incommensurability in a real way, um, and perhaps how that might have um, informed your process, um, and also that how that informed your relationship with each other as the residency um, unfolded. And it just doesn't need to be Patrick. I know it's spotlighted oh. on Patrick. Oh but yeah, no, I mean, um, yeah, yeah. I guess um, when I think about what you were saying is just in my studio practice that I think about that. And even before I came up with the uh, final piece uh, for the monument, it was about that. It was about um, the combinations of um, aesthetics that are uh, kind of, um, you know, here, but disappearing and being replaced by this overdevelopment or a new kind of aesthetic, that merging of the two, what does that look like? Um, this, you know, um, something um, is is uh, not quite right, um, but um, it's just something that I guess that I'm I'm not too conscious about because I'm guess I, I guess I'm so used to it and seeing it visually, it's something that comes up in my studio practice a lot, and um, it did come up in the drawings that I am um, kind of uh, or or the, the 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 kind of the development kind of stage that I uh, was. Um, when we were working on the, um, you know, the monument, it, it was it was uh, bouncing around. I think in in a lot of the um, photographs that I was taking, reference materials, things like that. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any other thoughts about this kind of uh, conundrum or incommensurability? Yeah, I mean, as artists, right? Like, um, we we tend to see things in ways most people don't. Um, and I, I like to use this analogy a lot. Um, as a community organizer, um, 
I hate the word activist because it's very reactionary, but also like an activist. One of the things that I learned was, um, I think it comes more from being a hacker than anything else. Like, um, is, is finding those points of intervention in, in things, either in, in the process of something, um, in the city code, um, how things operate, and finding out what that is and putting pressure there. And I use the analogy of becoming this little pip on somebody's shoe, right? Whether it's, you know, decision makers, because at some point they got us, no matter how small that pebble is, you're gonna stop and take it out of your shoe. And then, the, you know, if you can get people to stop and, and do something, um, as an artist, you can make shit happen. So um, that's kind of how I see, you know, kind of the work and the approach and, and going back to the, to the, you know, to, to Olvera, to that site, um, we knew that, you know, by toppling that statue first, we can build momentum. And if we kept pressure on, the, on that space, space that like is, is um, you know, this idea, it's unfinished, you know, and, and sometimes in unfinished things, um, as artists, we can make a lot of beauty out of it. So there's a lot of beauty to be made here, you know, and, and figuring out how to, you know, finalize this idea of a city in a way that is inclusive of everybody. Right. Um, so in, in that in that void, in that space, there is where like artists like us can operate. And so I see a lot of beauty being able to come out of that. I love what you just said. I'm so obsessed with this idea that, um, you know, I, I'm trained as, an, as a historian and we're trained to write definitive narratives, events, facts, dates, and so on, and people. Um, but I'm obsessed with this idea that open-ended inquiry and the process of just exploring and speculating um, is productive, right? Like the stakes of that are so high and they're so important. And so yeah. what you said, um, really resonated. And I'll share something. I probably shouldn't be sharing it, but I might get in trouble. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I, I really believe in open source everything. And um, because it's important, you know, it's important to that, like, as people, we have full access to knowledge building and, and all, all knowledge that's been, you know, built. Um, so my understanding is that on Monday, Indigenous Peoples Day, I guess like, you know, marketing has to work. Um, the city's gonna announce a, a great, the, the part that makes me happy is that they're not announcing like this finalized process that they've undergone, but they're announcing that they're gonna try and figure out what they haven't figured out yet uh, as to how to return that site where the Sarah statue was to the tribe, to the Tongva community. So not necessarily land back, but at least saying like, we're gonna figure out how we can give land back, um, along with a series of initiatives um, that thankfully are not just like um, performative, like switching Columbus to indigenous, indigenous people, things, which is important, but it's also performative. There's no resources allocated to it. Um, so like a series of initiatives with resources allocated to them. Um, and I share it because I don't know how they're gonna announce it. You know, city officials like to take credit for things. Um, but it wasn't something that, I mean, there's a lot of folks within the city who have done this work, so I have to acknowledge their work. Um, but there's a lot of other folks that are part of like this community that have been pushing for this. So, um, you know, the monument that I made is, is, is called, you know, it has a, the word network in there and it's, and it's built with this idea of finding ways to communicate with one another. So I'm glad that they're doing this and they're announcing this process, not necessarily this like finalized thing, um, and it's, you know, it's good to see that they're learning, that the city is learning and capable of learning, but don't tell nobody. <laughs> what you're saying actually leads me to another question that I have for each of you and maybe Nancy or Audrey, I would love to hear from you as well. Um, you know, the, I love the word speculative that's in the title of this residency, which gestures toward the creative, the theoretical, the open-ended, as well as, you know, process-based work. Um, but the word speculative also suggests a sense of risk and uncertainty, of unpredictability. And so I'm wondering if um, you encountered uncertainty and unpredictability during your residency or during your practice or you know, within your practice, how do you embrace it? Um, how do you address it? Um, how does it become a part of your work, especially with something, you know, especially in working with new media, I think. 
If you're working with new media, you better be used to it. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> and I think every artist on this panel understands exactly what I'm subtweeting right now. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, the speculative, uh, as I said before, I think the speculative nature of the, of the conceptual part of the work um, was really important. I think there's a reason why people look to science fiction to create, to look to, for new models of governance, new models of community and culture. Um, but, and that part, I could talk endlessly about that part, particularly because I think a lot about technology and ethics and technology and, and the kind of that, that you know, they, they call it the moral imagination. Like how do you, when you're imagining a future and you're not a techno -utop utopian uh, or utopist, I don't know how you'd say that, um, and you, you approach these things with a certain amount of criticality and skepticism, you know, how do you imagine the externalities of whatever you're proposing? Because there are always externalities. There is no way you are not going to have externalities. And so who, who might be impacted and how? Those are interesting questions. But, um, but in terms of on a personal level, how it affected process and, and this process, um, without, without getting too much into it, you know, I was in the... Um, privileged position, I, I guess, of, of both hosting these monuments and also making one. And the making of the one was, was challenging in its own way because um, I won't get into the technical reasons why it was challenging, but um, you know, I really wanted it to in, you know, it encompass so much of what I was thinking. That was really, really challenging to, to somehow synthesize these ideas into something um, a little more simple and, 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 and kind of engage a poetics of that. But you know, a platform is a difficult thing to maintain, and it comes with all kinds of um, <laughs> unprecedented, un unforeseen um, um, challenges. And every, I just have to say that everyone, both uh, everyone on this panel and Oxy as well, were really, really patient as my own app underwent some growing pains and, and challenges. And ultimately, just in the nick of time, as always happens. Um, came out on the other side, but let me tell you, um, that's, <laughs> if I could have speculated that that was going to happen, I might have done things slightly differently six months ago, but anyway, it all worked out for the best. So that's fine. Um, but that's what I would say about the speculative question. Yeah, I think that, um, speculative can mean a lot of different things. Um, it can, I guess like in a capitalist context, it can mean like making a gamble, you know, and taking a risk. And I think um, I went into my project with like a rough idea of um, imagining, speculating that the LA Police Protective League should be rendered obsolete. But I was like, I don't think I should be the only one to decide what should go there. So part of how I approach speculation is just like asking questions. And so it was really important for me to like make a survey and they can feel kind of like cold and sterile. I just made like a Google form thing. And I, and I was like really not sure if anyone would even want to fill out this thing. And there were such impassioned responses to questions like, why should the LAPPL and the Association of Los Angeles Deputy Sheriffs be abolished? And people really spoke from the heart and naming how they were such a source of fear and violence in their communities. And like, I kind of knew that it would be great to do a community center, but people were really specific about like what they wanted out of this site. And, um, I think just that I opening up the ideation process was so important to me because so often, even like in a real estate context, like speculation is so selfish, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, like when we were needing to um, come up, well, like I had to figure out like how to make a 3D model. I had never done that kind of thing before. But I was like, I haven't really worked with like architectural modeling at all. And I was just Googling. And most of the things that came up were like 3D programs for like real estate developers and had all these tools for modeling like luxury properties and kind of imagining this kind of like aspirational space, but aspirational is defined by 
like um, different values than community values. And I was like, oh, that's so interesting. Like, how can we take that speculative technology and way to like model something that could be there, but flip it and like give the power to the people who don't ordinarily like have those resources. I really appreciated what you were all, what um, you and who all were talking about with incommensurability and resources. And that's something I've learned a lot from like organizers, especially like during the past year um, in terms of the incommensurability of how resources are distributed in LA. Like it's a city that spends like more than $3 billion in taxpayer money like every year on policing to like support the one of the most like murderous police departments in the country. And the fact of that almost seeming like intractable is, is so horrific, you know? And I think that's something that I've really benefited from just like learning from organizers is that ability to like shift that narrative to from something that feels um, like a status quo to like, we gotta, you know, reimagine, we have to change what we think is actually possible in our lifetimes and devote energy to it. And that, a lot of that is like shifting narrative, but also narratives are attached to resources as well. Audrey, you said something brilliant about the kind of um, neoliberal technocratic uh, predictions of the future right here. And I think that's really important for us to all sort of think about as we continue on in this conversation. Um, but I guess, you know, Patrick, speaking of like, spe like real speculative or speculating on real estate prices, when and you talk about speculating, when you talk in terms of like capital markets, it means a very specific thing. And so, I mean, I guess, you know, in the site that you chose, right, the geolocation mm -hmm. of your sign, I'm mm -hmm. wondering kind of, what is it that you are, did you predict something for the future? Was there something sort of, what was it that was speculative about that gesture of placing that neon sign um, against that real estate sign? I, I'm wondering if you can sort of talk about um, the futurity sort of, or what kinds of futurities you imagine through your work rather. Yeah, so like uh, the placement, um, I was thinking about history um, my, my family's history, my um, father uh, living on um, Figueroa Street down the street um, in the 70s, um, and also my aunt and my cousins living down on Figueroa, also um, down from um, the site and around the area and them being kind of um, eventually uh, priced out of the area um, and moving um, outside um, of Los Angeles in California. So thinking of the future and knowing that that space might be developed or, um, you know, maybe we might see uh, the beautiful backdrop with the palm trees and mountains being um, eclipsed by a, you know, uh, development. Um, so I'm thinking about stuff that I'm used to seeing, but then also speaking um, the opportunity to, um, you know, visually change that in my sketches and the development of this piece, I was thinking about a, a, um, a development that would speak to the people that lived here, or, um, you know, my, my dad, my, my aunt, my cousins, something that they're used to seeing, um, something my brother's used to seeing, people that have been here, um, what they're used to seeing and creating a development um, for that. So I was thinking about um, that kind of future and places for them to live uh, with, uh, you know, like a discounted rent or, um, you know, um, Los Angeles, um, um, you know, honoring them or not, you know, just kind of like giving them um, um, some sort of break because they have developed this or they contributed to the development of the city in this um, in one way or another. Um, so that, that, that's what I was thinking about, friends and family moving away. Um, and if I had, you know, done something about it, what would it have been? What kind of development would have it been? And it kind of uh, did the drawings. And then, um, you know, initially it was like a development that uh, spoke to the, uh, 
the aesthetic of the city that was uh, one once was here and um now it, it, it evolved into a real estate sign um with the uh community aesthetic of like uh, shops that are in los angeles mom and pop shops the neon storefront signage combining those two and speaking um speaking like a, you know like a protest language instead of uh you know a 1-800 number or a phone number with someone's photo and name trying to um, sell real estate um yeah that's all. i think what's so evocative about the the work or the the sort of image of the work patrick is that it's an empty parking lot if i'm not mistaken or it's some kind of empty lot and it's an empty empty lot for sure yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so for me, that absence, you know, signifies something, mm -hmm. right? That there's still something open-ended about that. Mm -hmm. um, and that was particularly moving for me. And, you know, Joel, I actually have a question for you. I was reading part of your statement. You said something really important, which is that um, you said something along the lines of, you know, in indigenous thoughts, because, you know, indigenous is not just one thing, there are a lot of different tribes and nations, right? Um, but that, you know, sort of broadly, there are different modalities of marking time, right? And so along this sort of question around the speculative future, I'm wondering if you could maybe comment on um, different modes of making time, especially within your own practice, right? Um, where there's a, there's a very specific goal, which is to decolonize and repatriate land. Um, so I'm wondering if you um, could share a little bit more about what it means to make time um, within a time scale that is, again, purposefully incommensurate with kind of like the real estate developer, you know, the capital markets um, and so on and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. So. For, the, for folks who might not have been familiar with like the Olvera site and the Sarah Toppling, um, it was toppled on the summer solstice. Um, and then kind of the way things worked out, right? Like this, this AR project launched on the fall equinox the following year or this year. And Cindy Alvitre, who's a Tongva um, cultural bearer, likes to say like memories in the present. And it, it it can sound like very much like very poetic, but in reality, like for them, their ancestors' bones are still buried within, you know, within downtown LA and with, uh, within all these different places. So the impacts of colonization and what like this, the development of the city isn't in the past. Like, like when we talk about like, you know, the mission system, like it's very much still today. And the less and less that we talk about it in the past as, as you know, you know, Settler colonialism being like an in a constant project that is happening in the moment where we're calibrating how we see like our role in society, right? And and I hate to to like kind of be abstract about it, but um, or if it sounds abstract, I, I apologize. But it you know like what we do today like can record what what's happened in the past. Like if if we don't if we don't heal some of the like you know, some of the damage that's been caused by the development of the city, then a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, the trampling over these, you know, these burial sites, all that stuff remains an open wound. Um, and by now, everybody like, everybody understands that like intergenerational trauma exists, that it is a thing, you know, that it's not something that, um, that was speculated at one point, right? Like we know scientifically, that what our ancestors experience are carried in their bodies today. So a lot of times I see this work as being able to recode mm. and code out the stuff that we carry, all this trauma that we carry in our body. Um, you know, ceremonies, indigenous ceremonies that are held at specific times of the year, like the winter solstice, for example, um, are meant to do those things, right? Like let's come together, let's heal, let's, let's, let's talk about you know, what's happened in the year, let's shed some of these things. Um, so, you know, kind of the idea of having the constellations be part of the monument and bringing that closer to like us is a way of rethinking of how we see our place here while we're alive, right? Like the trauma that our great grandparents and our grandparents experience are gonna show up in our bodies. Like they say, it takes three generations before it shows up in your body. 
So we're responsible for healing some of that stuff so that our future generations don't carry it forward. So it's thinking about time both as like, you know, in our body seasonally, when we like put stuff down, you know, plant stuff to then harvest stuff out, um, you know, and that's, that's literally like planning food, but also like intentions, you know, like we put something down that day by taking something down, hoping that something else will grow there. Um, and so we're thinking of time in that way too. Like we're gonna use this time frame of like the seasons to really move along this, this idea of healing in the city. And it sounds abstract, but when you start thinking about it in those ways, and the one thing that COVID has, has showed us is that time is really like what we make of it, right? Like if we want to decide we're gonna slow down how we do our work and we're gonna do from this point forward four hour work days, right? Instead of five hour work days and all this other stuff. Um, yeah, like we, we can change it. You know, we operate off of a capitalist idea of time. Can, can we abolish that and change it? I think we can. Yeah. And cause, so that's kind of the thought behind it. So a question that I've been dying to ask the group, um, I mean, I'm so inspired by these conversations around time and kind of um, uh, thinking beyond, actually maybe not thinking beyond our bodies, but thinking with our bodies rather. Um, and my question has to do with the stuff of the works, right? So I'm really curious about what you think as artists, practicing artists, right? Um, what the limits are and the affordances are of augmented reality. So not only in terms of questions around access and what data experts call the digital divide, that is who can access and own technology and who does not have access to technology. But I'm really curious about what you think um, um, of AR, uh, what you think of in terms of AR as a medium, right? What are, like as, as something with materiality, let's say. So what are its affordances? What has it obscured in your work? Um, I'm just, I'm really curious about kind of how you as artists, right? Like are thinking about AR, VR um, and other, other forms of new media that we can go into. Um, but I am dying to know. I mean, it was my first experience working in AR. I never, um, and I never played Pokemon Go. <laughs> so <laughs> I, it was um, pretty new to me, um, but it was interesting because it really connected with some ideating I had been doing like a year and a half prior when um, I was starting a residency at ACLU of Southern California, which is across the street from the site that I worked on. And like on Google maps, I saw that there was like the side of the LAPPL building was just like this big blank wall. And I'm like, wouldn't it be interesting to do a piece that's like, I don't know, a light projection or something onto it, like as a kind of um, activating the site. And then all of a sudden this, um, well, not all of a sudden, but uh, this residency kind of like clicked in to that. Um, and that it's like, oh, why stop there? Let's just reimagine this whole building and like Google Maps kind of played into that again, because although like um, Google Street View is, so a lot of people see it as like a kind of invasive kind of surveillance um, technology. It also allowed me to like recreate the building um, like in Blender, uh, like taking the different sides and basically like recreating it like a box. And um, in addition to AR, like learning Blender was just like really eye-opening because that's a community-based um, like open source program that people are like constantly improving. And like, you can build entire worlds and build like an entire like 3D um, animated film without having to like have the resources of a Hollywood studio. And Nancy was like a great coach, <laughs> in, you know, cheering me along, um, but that felt like it compressed the ideation time of something just like an errant thought to like a fully realized like 3D model. It felt like, oh wow, these tools are really powerful. And sometimes people need to see something to believe it. So I'm like, what if more people learn this and like 
um, we're able to like do more um, like planting these more like utopian ideas um, <laughs> into the world, you know, so that we're not limited by what uh, real estate developers like dream for our city, you know, so um, learning AR and just like seeing how it like meshes with reality was, it felt like it sped up um, that, that process. You said something right now, Audrey, that just kind of was an aha moment for me. Um, you know, I, I parallel like AR and VR technology in the way that it is now with, with printmaking that printmaking is very democratic. You know, you can teach it, it's accessible. Um, and you can even, you know, print make as a protest, you know, like in front of like marches and all that stuff. So taking this technology and putting it in the hands of, of like elders and the senoras, you know, the, the, the aunties. Uh, and when you said that about like, you know, architects using this technology to like come and try and like force feed us this idea of like this development, like this is good for you. Um, what if we put that technology in the community members that were at those meetings and be like, here, create it yourself. Like you can do it yourself. Um, I think that would be very powerful. I think that, you know, using it in that form um, is, is one way to like push back against like, you know, I think unintentionally architects um, get tricked into coming to these meetings and pushing these projects because I mean, they got paid to do it. They're thinking like, well, housing is housing and it's important, but community members reimagining their own communities, right? Like that. I think using it in that way, I think is would be really good. Um, so for me, that's kind of the thought behind it, right? Like how how much how much more can we democratize this so that you know everyday folks can pick it up and do it? Any other thoughts? Any limitations? I mean, I I have been working in AR since two thousand seventeen. And we developed the app in February, 2018. So I feel very intimately acquainted with its um, extraordinary magic and its, um, and its shortcomings, and all of which are in the process of being addressed. You know, it is, it's a, an accelerated medium because there is such demand for it because there, are, uh, there is more access to it. Although I would argue that some of that access is actually corporate controlled and is very problematic certain um, platforms where you can develop your own AR um, filters, for example, are not your IP. So it's, um, I think there's quite a bit of work to be done there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's part of what we are, we were all responding to as sort of individuals facing the sort of hyper object of, of not our own powerlessness per se, but the reason why we, but the reason, at least I can speak for myself, the reason why I was so drawn to the community um, potential of AR is because of the kinds of conversations you can have and the kinds of conversations you can have that it prompts because it is deployed this way anyway, um, a very subversive medium. And that's how we've tried to use it um, over many, many years, inviting artists to choose artworks and have conversations at sites where their work has more resonance, where they can add meaning, add layers of meaning because it is a digital layer. Um, I think it has this extraordinary ghost quality. We've talked about this in our early conversations that once you know a piece is there, like I will never ever go to any of these sites um, and not have a memory uh, um, in my body, not just of the, of course of the image itself, but more importantly of the ideas they activated. So I really think of this as idea activation versus um, site activation in a way, because it, it will have that longevity, I think, well beyond whatever's there. Um, and I also would say that it's an incredibly ephemeral medium. And so it also fits beautifully into conversations that around time, space time um, influence. Um, and one of the things that I have found most beautiful about some of my, I've been lucky enough to collaborate now with dozens, if not hundreds of artists, um, for example, like in New Orleans, the way that you can use AR to reclaim space, um, to um, and and to to do it on terms that are non-destructive, 
You know, you aren't digging things up. You aren't pulling things down. You can, you don't have to ask permission. You can be guerrilla about it. And that's, I think what, uh, why a lot of artists love it. But um, I agree. I think it is becoming more, it's getting increasingly accessible. I think we always have to keep a very trained eye on who's making it accessible and what and how I, I you know, open source is awesome, but certain um, applications are not. And so I think we have to pay attention to that always. But, um, but I just think it's exhilarating that it, you know, if, it, if it expands your practice, if it gives you another angle, if it gives you another opportunity to, to see your work realize and to share your ideas outside of any traditional context, that's what AR can do among many, many, many other things. I want to pick up on something that you just said about um, how it allows people to take up space in nonviolent ways. And I want to um, shout out to the Artsakh monument that also used fourth wall app um, and the ways in which artists and activists of the Armenian diaspora are, you know, who have effectively their ancestors have been kicked out of their homelands, their ancestral lands, and the ways in which they evoke presence, right, within, in their ancestral homelands, and, and that kind of way I think is really evocative and powerful. Um, I want to invite folks, I'm looking at the time, invite folks here, I think there are 27 of you left still, so yay, yay for us. If you have any questions or comments, please um, feel free and brave and welcome to add them to the Q&A. Um, while you think of them, I have one last question for you and then, oh, anonymous attendee has one. Okay, wait, but first I wanna know really quickly, um, what did you learn from each other through the residency? So this is a time for you to, you know, build each other up, but also just, um, I, I'm very curious because, you know, you did spend time together um, throughout the summer. What, what did you learn from each other's practice? You know, so going off of the, those last comments from Nancy and you, Tricia, of this idea of like, do no harm, right? Um, and, and Audrey, Audrey, you know, brought this to the group, um, you know, just the, the abolitionist framework, right? And not just abolitionists, but folks doing work around restorative transformative justice and like bringing in these, these, these practices that also come from um, helping people off addiction and stuff like that, you know, like the idea as artists operating with, with, the, with the concept of like, do no harm, like do your, your practice your creativity with, with that at the core and it shifts, it shifts how you engage community, it shifts how you tell stories, it shifts how, it just shifts everything. Um, so I think it was really important for, for also like, you know, um, in this conversation between us, like for me to like, I want to do so much with what I want with the project and, I, and, and it was going in another direction and Audrey kind of just, you know, like her bringing that to the, to, to the conversation just centered me and like, okay, I got to go back to like what I know how to do and be that conduit, not be like the, like the, the artist and just serve as, as, and just serve. So do it like, you know, the concept of do no harm, I think is, was really great. I'll say that um, from Patrick, I learned like how much like longing can be in your relationship to a place and how important it is to like honor that. Um, and especially in the conversation of like, oh, what is an, oh, what's like a hot neighborhood or what's a trendy neighborhood? And it's like, where have people like rooted their memories and like how important it is to, um, not erase that from a place, um, even from a place that like changes so fast, like LA. And um, from Nancy, I learned like how expansive technology could be. <laughs> Cause it's like thinking about for like just creating the fourth wall app, it's like such a generous use of technology. And it's a lot of work. Like you have an amazing team, lots and lots of hours and expertise and you know, blood, sweat and tears <laughs> to like realize these in digital installations and thinking about like, you could go anywhere in the world and like, you can like build new worlds in there. So that was truly 
like that it, that was a big aha <laughs> to be exposed to that way of thinking and then with Hoel I'm like so I love how um important it is to like honor the Tongva people and um and to have that collaboration be ongoing and your piece actually um the sapling I I put like a like a very old live oak <laughs> into my model imagining that kind of like imagining different moments in time like oh a hundred years from now but also like hey this could this building could transform next year and so I wanted to like connect with your piece in some way um in that kind of like futuristic thinking so yeah I was it, it's been super inspiring I mean like it's been a virtual residency but we're all we've been all kind of like on the same wavelength working on these projects For me, I mean, it's uh, through, this is my first AR uh, piece. And, um, you know, I was kind of, um, the speed of it was uh, new, right? Like it's about collaborating. It's about coming together and um, trying to put this uh, piece together. And i um, not used to that. I'm used to just kind of taking materials and making um, um, things. Um, but having said that, like in AR, like I just, with all the artists, the layering and the richness that they brought to, you know, all the, you know, the, the work that they, they, um, they uh, manifest, um, the, the work that they kind of came up with, it's just, um, it's refreshing to see. Um, and it definitely in AR, it's like something new to me. It's my first piece, like I said, and um, that kind of layering and, and, and um, it was just enjoyable to see that being developed um and it kind of opened my eyes and definitely with Nancy kind of uh, getting me to edit you know without her telling me ed edit the piece down to what I'm really trying to say and just kind of um you know really um like well said just really serve um and 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 um put a piece out there that um maybe the city needs something that, that needs to be said um so it, it's a lot of those things and it was very enjoyable um to see something come alive um in a new medium that i'm not used to um and watching the artist kind of uh, breathe that richness and, and layering and life into it something that you know can be seen um via um, an app is is re super refreshing yeah, I would just echo everything everyone has said, and I'm so touched by what what everyone has said. And I would also just add that, you know, I think I was indelibly influenced by every single project. And I and I think I can't remember who said it. Maybe Trisha, you did at the beginning that there is a there are some really common intersecting themes, and they all have to do with care. And I think each one of us is deeply concerned with um, imagine you know acknowledging and recognizing that incommensurate uh, and disparate, the, the sort of the dissonance, I would say, between uh, so, much, so much abundance and so much scarcity all at once. And that that is completely um, asymmetrical. There's no balance. And so each one of us in trying to kind of grok that and, and process it has come up with, with our own answers, not answers, but suggestions, ideas, um, hopes, and dreams, and I think that you know, I was I, I was so inspired by the other artists. I was deeply appreciative of their patience, and um, and sort of determination to to get to exactly what they wanted. And I mean, that's always inspiring. And I I mean, not to be like maudlin or anything, but I don't know. And and this isn't this isn't to exclude anyone else, but I find collaborating with other artists to be one of the great privileges um, of my professional life, and 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 it's a humbling and inspiring one. And so I love sharing m my app in these contexts, and um, I'm lucky to have one. I'm lucky to have that, and but I'm most lucky to know these artists and to have worked with them. So that's what I would say. So we have some questions from the audience. Um, an anonymous attendee asks a very interesting question. Have you considered what a physical version of your monument might 
be? Would a physical presence of an object even be of interest to you? How would it be akin to or different from what it is virtually? I love this question. Um, should we be building physical monuments, I think? That's what it boils down to. Who wants to take this? Well, the one the one monument that I um, the the oak sapling right um, that idea comes from Cindy Alvitre who I mentioned earlier and the reason the oak tree right like and the name astrorhizal networks rifts off of mycorrhizal networks which is how oak trees use funguses or fungi to communicate with insects other plants and all through the idea of care. Are enough nutrients transferring back and forth between all these different living beings? And so the oak tree is the instigator of that communication through, through fungi. Um, so yeah, do we, should, we, should we plant more oak trees in LA? Absolutely. Um, so that's the monument that like I, I desire, right? Like if we can bring back the nature that was here before the city was built, by shifting, you know, the landscape even just a little bit, you see these birds come back. You see these, you know, pollinators like butterflies and stuff come back. You see, you, you know, you start to see even like the the hawks come back, like just by small little pivots and and opening up space so that like trees can grow. And not to say that trees are like the solution to everything, but like specifically here in Los Angeles, oak trees carry that like ecosystem or spark that ecosystem that I think we can all learn from. Can I just add to that? I mean, the shade is actually a justice issue and planting more trees in neighborhoods without trees is a beautiful idea and exactly the kind of monument, like we have monumental trees, you know? Um, I personally believe, uh, you know, I'm obviously a big fan of virtual monuments. I think, I, I think we don't necessarily need more things. I think, um, I think, yeah, focusing on things that grow, that feed, that, that improve our ecosystem in ways that that not just we benefit from, but that you know the other ecosystems benef benefit from seems seems timely at this moment. Yeah, I mean, for me, um, people had mentioned you know, and I I enjoy that energy, the vitality that can, you can kind of bring, um, like you know, essentially an idea or a sketch, and and you don't have to ask permission, like Nancy said, to place that in. You know, you know, geotag it into a space, and just kind of go off on whatever you're kind of feeling at the time, or whatever you know your your idea is, and put it down. And and for me, this kind of came about this uh, this this residency and and putting together this piece, and people are now telling me, oh, this needs to actually happen, or you should make this. And, you know, um, the first thought is like, well, I, um, I don't know if I really want to make another object that fills uh, space when, you know, that, you know, uh, that space could probably be used for something else. And I think about like the, um, um, you know, public, you know, like public uh, mural projects that, you know, um, kind of come, come onto my table and just the reasons that I don't make uh, public works too many is just because you know it's it's so um it's like you know populating a space and having to um i don't know like it's it's it there's a lot of uh, thought that should go behind it and and it's 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 um occupying a wall visually um in a you know in a city or an area that you you know may live in don't live in um and it's just, that's a lot of responsibility for me, you know, and I enjoy making work in my studio. Um, but, you know, there's something to be said about uh, uh, pieces that uh, are um, well thought out, really, um, the meetings are done and all that. Um, and, 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 and um, you know, there's, there's years of work behind them. But um, I don't know, I, I, I um, you think about it, and then it's just kind of like, you feel like it's you're imposing visually, and that's what I like about um, AR uh, monuments and um, um, these pieces is because you can access them if you feel like you want to. They're not um, you're not driving down the street and they're just popping up. 
Yes, I would say that I designed um, my piece to be as actionable as possible. Um, rather than designing like a whole new structure, I was like, how quickly can this building be vacated? Um, can this ugly building that like BLM LA like calls to be toppled like every week, how can it be transformed, you know? Um, and I think she might still be on the call. Um, Stephanie Luna, who's um, advocates on behalf of the family of um, Anthony Vargas, who was killed by um, LA Sheriff's deputies. Like she, I, I used her quote from the survey to open my essay because she just lays out this really wonderful, actionable vision for like a community where like kids feel safe, like to like walk or bike right down the street. Like that can't happen soon enough, you know? And yeah, I'd love to, for that parking lot to be dug up and for it to be like a community park or garden. And so, um, yeah, I think I, I would love for it to be like a functional blueprint for something that's possible ASAP. Actually, Audrey, I want to, what you said um, dovetails into, I'm gonna skip around. <clears throat> I see more questions. A question that Danny Snelson posed. Um, Danny says, I was so moved seeing these artworks across the city in this app. I'm wondering if the process and production has spurred your imagination for futures wherein AR is ubiquitous. What might you build or rewrite in this city with no limitations, technical or otherwise. So sort of, I think that dovetails perfectly off of what Audrey just said. <clears throat> Can I answer that obliquely by answering another question I just saw, which is about sens sensory engagement. Um, Aviva asked about, um, are these all sight? Some of these monuments have sound, Audrey's and, and uh, Hoel's and mine all have sound. And um, that's another part of the sort of extraordinary immersive potential of the medium. And actually the Arsak monument did as well, of course, many of them do. Um, but it's another way of engaging the senses and kind of um, providing or inviting a, a transformative experience in shared immersive space. In other words, it isn't m merely, you know, a visual experience. And I would argue that Patrick's, although it doesn't have sound attached to it, the ambient sound of the street, of the birds, of all of that, that's part of the art experience. That's part of the, the experience itself. So um, I think as we imagine, you know, these sort of, um, what, what if we weren't constrained by some of the current limitations, my hope would be to engage more of the senses, you know, moving forward, interactive uh, elements, you know, we, I don't think haptics are anywhere in the near future, but you know, there are all kinds of ways that you can engage bodies because it's when we experience things in our bodies and we respond viscerally that, that we have impact when we're moved, when we're, you know, prompted to think, to consider, to, um, to grapple with whatever it is the artist is, is um, inviting into the conversation. And, you know, I wanna actually add on to that, Aviva, thank you so much for your question. Um, I know I'm not an artist, you know, I'm moderating this panel, but something that I think is really important is that I don't want us to only focus on AR, even though it's really important and what virtual technology can do. What we have to really remember is that all four of these artists, um, the AR is just a tool, the process, the conversations with community members, the relationships that are built, the sort of qualitative surveys that Audrey did, right? For instance, um, the conversations with friends and family that Patrick has every day, that is, I think perhaps, I wouldn't even say like 90% of these projects. So, you know, I think it's easy to get lost and too focused into, in, in on VR um, and AR and, and so on and so forth, but, um, the process is, is what I think is really compelling here. Um, uh, Danny's question disappeared. Any other thoughts about, you know, what other artists here might build or rewrite in Los Angeles without any limitations? I mean, you've already sort of done that with your work, but is there anything else that you would you know, want to add on? Without saying too much, um... One of the tribal communities here in California is is looking at using AR to, you know, like m minimize erasure 
that they experience within their city. And this is a massive project that they're thinking of undertaking um, that spans beyond like their community, but is, is connecting with other tribal communities in California. Like, so like this, the idea that something as, as um, something like AR can, can help reframe how tribal communities engage with one another, I think is also really, really powerful. So I'm, I'm just like, I'm blown away that that's the approach that they're taking it. Like, you know, that they're not looking at technology as, as a barrier to like telling their story, but actually using these, these different strategies to hijack like the, the infrastructure that they, that they live in. So I think that's, you know, the more, the more of that we have from, um, and these aren't, these aren't young folks in these, like in, in this, in, in this instance, it's like older folks thinking of, about it. So I can't wait to see how the younger folks use this technology to like really like project themselves into the future. We have two other questions, but I'm also seeing that we have five minutes more. So one question from Teddy Pozo asks, are there any tips you could share from your experience for creating something using AR and in the spaces of LA? Can other people use the fourth wall app? And then Mashinka Hakobian asks, um, what were your community members or visitor responses to the monuments that you created? Um, and what interactions with the monuments have looked like in C2? So two different questions, and I invite you to answer either of them with the four minutes we have. Well, I can speak to um, Blender in that it's like, you can just go on their website and start learning it like tonight if you wanted to. Um, and whether or not you insert it into like, um, though insert is a very light word. I know it's a big process <laughs> if you, um, to place it. Yes, UT University. Um, you can take that model and, and um, do like a photo collage to, to visualize um, something in, in real space. And that can then be mobilized and, and kind of put out into the world. Um, so Blender plus YouTube and Google, <laughs> you can start um, envisioning all kinds of things. Yeah, tutorials are awesome. If you have access to tutorials, you can, Almost everything is Googleable. It turns out, most problems, mm -hmm. most questions. It, my favorite the, one was uh, how to how to make a building from a single photo. That <laughs> one was really key for me. And there were others who had asked that question. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, can if other people want to make monuments using the point, the Fourth Wall app is a platform, not a content creator. So to Audrey's point, Blender or any other three D software, or any number of ways you can create. Um, AR, there are also other AR apps. Mine is a curated platform. I have my own uh, virtual reality drawings that have been translated into AR that anyone can put anywhere. And then there's the, then there's the coordinates platform, which has to do with these kinds of geolocated um, idea activations. And um, that is, I am sadly one person. And so I can only handle a few curated projects a year, um, but um, I, I'm, you can always reach out to me um, through my email or Instagram or whatever, and I'm happy to point you in the direction of um, of some other AR apps that might be um, might be a great place to start. Well, with that, I think it's the perfect time to wrap things up. Um, I'm so grateful for uh, being able to have this privilege of spending time with you and, and picking your brains and learning so much. Um, I want to thank you so much for your work, for your efforts. Um, I wanna thank Oxy Arts and Frankie in particular for your tirelessness and your labor, Meldia of course, um, and Mashinka um, and everyone at Oxy Arts. Thank you so much for attending this program. Um, again, please check out these artists work online, head over to Oxy Arts on York to see uh, the exhibition that's up till November 19th and um, follow everyone on Instagram and support their work. And I wish you a wonderful evening and I also wish you safety because it's a pandemic.
Um, good night, everyone. Thank you so much.